Are you ready for the message? All right, all right. We're in a series titled, That's My Church. We're in week four of it. I'll give you a quick little big thought of why we uh, started this series. Every July, I, as uh, the pastor of Mission Church, uh, and when I say pastor, I understand the book of Colossians says he's the head of the church. I'm just here stewarding what God called me to steward. Uh, but as you steward uh, a church like Mission Church, uh, my desire is never ever to pastor a church that would upset God. I want to please God. I want our church to please God. So every July, I kind of just take an assessment. God, are we still chasing the things you called us to chase? Are we, uh, are we a church that has the right aim, the right spirit? Are we, are we becoming too religious? Are we becoming too licentious? Lord, is there anything that we need to fix? I basically bring the car into the shop and say, what you got, God? And the reality is, is that this church will always have an aim of pleasing God. Five years I've been senior pastoring, going on six in uh, February. Uh, I've been pastoring for 20 years total, but senior pastoring for five plus. Um, I've gotten a good amount of emails the last 20 years. Um, and uh, through those emails, uh, a lot of the time it's simple things like uh, more worship, less worship, too loud, uh, too quiet, uh, too dark, too bright. Like these are emails uh, I get, yes. Uh, DMs, uh, wear this, don't wear that. Uh, uh, share this, don't share that. Um, address this, don't address that. And so that's happened the last 20 years. And if I were to respond and live out every email, uh, DM I've gotten through this, our church will look schizophrenic. Um, one Sunday, loud, quiet, dark, light. It would just look nuts. Because a lot of time, uh, what happens is people bring their preferences. And, and, and a shepherd sometimes, if I'm being honest, there's a temptation to try to please your preference. We all lose when I please your preference. We all win when we try to please God. And that's what this series is about. And so each week I've looked through text uh, and scripture trying to find places where God was pleased with his church. Well, today's text is actually the opposite, but we can learn from this because this is one of the moments when Jesus is most displeased with his disciples. You don't want to, I mean, you don't want to displease Jesus. And this is like one of the ones where you're like, whoo, he is upset with his crew. Um, are you ready for the message? Matthew 17 says this. Uh, and when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic, epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and is often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Woo, that's an email to Jesus. I came to your church today, and your church sucked. That's <laughs> basically what the guy said. Yo, Rumor on the street is that your kingdom has power. Rumor on the street is that when I encounter you and your people and their, the presence of God, things that are destroying me are supposed to leave. But I came to your disciples, and it was nothing burger. I just stood there, and they couldn't do anything. And the reality is, is that just because you slap the word church on a building does not mean it has power and authority that it's moving back the gates of hell. No, no, no. The church that's going to move back the gates of hell understands that there is one that actually has all the power. Can I rewind? Whoop. Matthew 10. Jesus says to the disciples, I give you all power and authority. Fast forward to Matthew 17. And they're operating with no power and authority. But he gave them all power and authority. My question to you is Jesus, when you got saved, says, here's all power and authority. Ever since you've been saved, do you feel like you've been operating with power and authority? Or do you feel like this person that says, literally the translation says, his son feels like he's being thrown into the fire, being thrown into water to be drowned. AK, do you feel like in your life sometimes you're being thrown into situations that you never wanted to be thrown into? Being thrown into difficult things like, why is this happening over and over again? Can I just tell you real quick, can I, can I, can I be your pastor, but like, can I speak some biblical stuff to you real quick? There is an assignment on your life from the enemy of hell to steal, kill, and destroy. To destroy your marriage, to destroy your dreams, to destroy your health, to destroy everything that you hold dear. There is literally a, a principality assigned to this region shooting darts of doubt, darts of literally demonic forces at your life and at your family. What are you doing about it? How are you processing it? How are you going to battle every day? Because the reality is, is that a church that pleases God takes the gates of hell and stomps on it. Yeah. Understands the power and authority that was given to them. 
And at this moment, the disciples have completely missed it. And because of it, people are suffering. Uh oh, we got 23 minutes. I, that, was just, it, that wasn't even in my notes. All I wrote here is man eyes diagnosis in the natural. <laughs> Problems in the Bay Area are not only natural. That's all I wrote in my notes. And then I just went off. Okay, okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> let's keep going, okay. <laughs> then Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation. He's displeased. What does it mean to be faithless and perverse generation? He's saying, oh, this generation, you're so unplugged from heaven. Perverse, but you're so plugged into the world. He goes, oh, you faithless, perverse generation. He goes on, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Uh, can I just tell you quick, Jesus is having this moment because literally right before this, he tells his disciples, I'm gonna go die for mankind. I'm gonna save the lost world. And Peter goes, no, don't do that. Stay here and hang out with me. And Jesus is like, step away from me, Satan. Like the, the, the disciples are having all these carnal temporal moments thinking about themselves, not about heaven, not about the eternal. And when Jesus is saying, how long shall I be with you? He's saying, how long? The translation is, is it's not fair is actually what it's saying. It's saying, how long will you think this way? How long will you be a, 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 a worldly person that thinks only worldly, only temporal, only about these things? When are you gonna shift your mind to the heavenly? When are you gonna unplug from the world and actually plug into heaven and have all of your birthright? He goes, how long, how long is this going to take? So he goes on to say, um, uh, bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. When I was preparing this, I had asked myself a big question. I want to ask you the question. When's the last time you rebuked a demon? How's your rebuking doing this week? Has it been a good rebuking month? I have failed you as a pastor. If I have not taught you to rebuke the gates of hell, I have failed you. And that's what happened this week when I prepared it. I'm going to get a little vulnerable today. Uh, we're, we're going to shift some things in, a, in, in our calendar because of this message. I, I don't want to say this lightly. Uh, this sermon prepping, this last two weeks of just being with the Lord has just pressed upon me that us as a church and a people, that we have to turn it up a notch in prayer, turn it up a notch in fasting, turn it a notch up in faith. And the reality is, if we have not done those things, the enemy is going to have a heyday in your life, in my life, and in the Bay Area. And if you read the news, he's having a heyday in the Bay Area right now. But not on our watch, no longer. And so the reality is, is that there are principalities. I mean, some of you are like, what do you mean? There's demons? Our faith. The reason, here's what we believe, if, you, if you're brand new to church, but if you're a Christian, here's what you believe, that a man who died walked out of a grave, <laughs> conquered death, that's, and, then, and then ascended to heaven. Like that, that takes a lot of faith. But then you're like, hey, watch out for demons. Well, that's too much. <laughs> I draw the line right there. Don't believe it. Mm -mm -mm. Nope, 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 nope. Heaven, hell, sure, but de demons around today. Nope, 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 nope. Ephesians 6, we do not wrestle against this world, but principalities, evil rulers. You need to do so. Everything you struggle with is not always practical. Sometimes there is a spiritual force behind it. And everything you deal with is not spiritual. Sometimes you're just making practical bad decisions. Okay? Okay? But a lot of you, have not really processed the spiritual. And I'm, I'm praying that we become a church that rebukes better. Yes. You wanna have a revival, start rebuking. Start binding things that are stealing. And so he goes, he rebuked the demon. It's interesting because the man said, hey, my son has, a, he, he diagnosed him, he's an epileptic. He thinks it's a natural problem. And Jesus doesn't even diagnose the natural. He says, no, I'm diagnosing the spiritual. There is a demonic force behind this that is trying to destroy your son. So he rebukes the demon and it came out of him, the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? I love that. No, just kidding, privately. They weren't like in front of everybody, oh, excuse me. They're like walking with Jesus, it's all over. And I wonder who did it. They're like, you know, maybe eating lunch. And they're like, Jesus, could I ask you a question? Um, why couldn't we do that? Because in Matthew 10, you said that we had all power and authority, but then they came and we were like, Boop, 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 boop. 
and the boy still was, you know, epileptic, and then the dad's like, you guys suck, and we're like, boop. <laughs> Lord, what, what, what's going on? And I love that they asked the question. Have you asked God the question lately? Why is my life the way it is? Why is my marriage the way it is? Why are my emotions the way they are? Why is my mental health this way? Why am I so cynical? Why am I so angry all the time? Why am I so depressed all the time? Why do I work? When's the last time you asked God, why is this happening? I applaud that they asked the question. And so they asked the question, why? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. And the unbelief is not just in Jesus, but the unbelief of actually, God gives a roadmap. He gives us the tools and the promise of his word. Live this way and watch what happens. And some of you just don't believe still that he said, if you prayed this way and lived this way and prioritized this way and had your calendar, calendar oriented this way and started fasting this way, that something would happen. You think you can just live your life and still have everything heaven has for you. He goes, but because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible uh, for you. Stop. If you are a new believer in the house, or you've never really studied this text, uh, Jesus is not saying that you could say to Mount Diablo, move. Come back. Move. Come back. Like, how, like, it would be crazy, like, just move Mount Diablo left or right for a little bit. Uh, how many times in your life has a physical mountain been the problem in your life? Like, you know what? Mount Diablo is just bothering me today. Move Mount Diablo. But if you li read this literally and you don't execute the scripture, you think God's actually saying you're going to move physical mountains. No, no. There was a very common term during Jesus' day, and people were called uprooters, mountain movers, pulverizers. A.K.A. faith-filled people at this time were ones that said when a difficult situation arised, the ones that had faith were called mountain movers. But the people who had no faith never could get through any difficult situation. What Jesus is saying is if you have faith, no matter how difficult the situation, you're going to be able to move it out of the way and you're going to be able to conquer it. This is the text and what it's saying to us. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Everybody say this kind. There's something about this kind of problem. And you know when you're processing this kind of problem. When, when you get to a place, this kind of problem needs this kind of prayer and this kind of fasting. And what he's saying is, is that you walked into the situation of life, you walked into this day, and the problem was somebody had a demonic force that was literally destroying their life, and you just wanted to walk up and be like, boop, problem solved. How many of us would love, would love to just have a button just go, boop, problem solved. Marriage is going Boop, I prayed, problem solved. I'm not very happy right now. Boop, I'm happy again. Oh, finances are bad. Boop, finances are good. And this is what the disciples were doing. This is why they failed. And he says, if you actually want to take back ground, there is power in preparation. If there's power. If you would have prayed beforehand, if you would have fasted beforehand, if you would have believed what I said, you would have taken back ground and you would have lived the day that I actually would have had ordained for you. But instead, you encounter something that you weren't ready for because you lived a worldly life. You were, aka, plugged into the world instead of living a heavenly life. Are you ready to be a mountain mover? Yeah. Are you ready to punch the enemy in the face? Yeah. Are you ready to take back ground that you never take back ground before? Yeah. Will you bow your heads and pray? God, we give you today's word, we give you the message. Oh, we need you, Jesus. Oh, the Bay Area needs you. Lord, we repent for making things so practical at times and not really leaning into the spiritual. We repent for not believing what your word says. God, may we be a people of faith. May we be a people of prayer. And may we be a people of fasting. May my words fall to the floor and your sore. Oh, God, we need you. We need you. We need you. And everybody said? Amen. All right, so we're going to look at three things. They lacked three things in this verse, and it very, uh, it upset the Lord. Let's say it displeased Jesus. Uh, they lacked faith, they lacked prayer, and they lacked fasting. Mission Church will not lack faith. You will not lack prayer, and you will not lack fasting. So let's talk about all three. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to help you the best I can as your pastor. Um, there's this um, term used for rockets. 
If you ever, uh, we were in Florida and we missed a, uh, one of our Rachel and I bucket lists. Uh, I don't know if it's your, one of your bucket lists, but one of our bucket lists is to go to NASA. We went to NASA a few years ago uh, in 2020. Uh, we, we, we saw the you know, space shuttle and the Apollo and, and a bunch of different things. And once we were there, we just had this thing like, we want to see a rocket take off right there in Florida. We want to see it, you know, Cape Canaveral, whatever it's called, uh, area. What is it, Cape Canaveral? Yeah. Um, and uh, we want to see like a, uh, like a space shuttle take off, something like, like and we, we found out there's like, there's stands, you can watch it. So it's one of our new bucket lists. Like, I, I can't wait to just like, <laughs> it's gonna be awesome, okay? Um, uh, well, something I found out uh, about rocket ships is that for them to take off to space, they have to achieve this um, thing called escape velocity. Escape velocity. There is this gravitational pull that is literally holding the rocket back from getting to where it's supposed to go. And so scientists got in the lab, did all their calculations, you know, and they came down, they're like, we've got it. We have to go this fast, the weather has to look like this, and it has to be designed like this. And basically, it has to create an abnormal amount of speed to get through uh, the atmosphere to get space. I meet a lot of Christians who are just stuck, and their gravity is not, I'm not talking natural gravity, there is this supernatural gravity on their life and they never actually escape to where they're supposed to get to. So they say yes to Jesus, but they never say yes to the kingdom of heaven. They say yes to salvation, but they never walk through the door and actually escape the, the world. They stay plugged into the world, and they never really plug into heaven. And I'm here to give you the fuel for escape velocity for your life. And the reality is, is the, the three things that you need more than anything to, to escape the, the, the world's way is you need faith, you need prayer and you need fasting. You get that kind of fuel, you're gonna have an abnormal life in all the right ways. So let's, let's look at faith real quick. So uh, I just wanna talk about faith a, a little bit. I talked about it a lot last week, um, of course, with uh, um, Sarah, but I, I want you to see this real quick. Matthew 17, then Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Uh, bring her here to me. Um, we are living in the age of cynicism. So, the age of cynicism is basically, they've done studies, Pew Research, I mean, you name it, CNN, MSNBC, they've done all these studies. 19% of this generation now uh, actually has faith in stuff. And what I mean by that is like, it's such a cynical age now that people don't even have faith in marriage anymore. They don't have faith in politics, they don't have faith in religion. Basically, the way culture is built now is to question and doubt everything. Like there, there is no like, Assume the best. There is no trusting. Trust is not in the tool belt anymore. Belief has been thrown out in our culture. Like we don't, be, we don't believe. <laughs> Please, everybody's, everybody's bad. Everything's this. And so we live in an age of cynicism. And when you live in an age of cynicism, you basically uh, birth a culture that never moves forward anymore, but just sits there and complains and whines. Are you, are you encouraged right now? How do you escape the age of cynicism? How do you escape it? You know, the, um, I, I, I used this illustration about two years ago. Um, it's called crab in a bucket. Uh, basically, our culture is like crabs in a bucket. Uh, you put a bunch of crabs in a bucket. One of the crabs is trying to escape uh, the bucket. And the other crabs are like, yo, if I'm going to be in a prison forever, you're going to be in prison forever. <laughs> and so, like, the crabs start climbing out. And then the crab just pulls them back down. And then one crab starts pulling out, going out, and then another crab pulls them back down. So you put a bunch of crabs in the bucket, none of them can get out, but they work together, they could get out. And what happens in our culture is somebody starts believing for great things, and they're around the age of cynicism, people are like, come back down here, life sucks. I believe God, God's going to redeem something. <laughs> get back down here, that's not going to happen. I'm, I'm believing that God's going to, come on, get down here. And I'm believing that, that the church can still do great things in the Bay Area. <laughs> Have you seen them? <laughs> come back down here. I, I believe that, that God could still have the greatest revival ever in all of America. I believe it. I believe it. What are you talking about? Get back down here. Because that's what cynicism does. It just pulls you right back down. Live, live in cynicism with me. And so I'm going to give you a couple tools on how to live a life of faith. You ready? First one is you need to get around faith people. You need to get around faith people. Um, I, I've been pastoring five years. And it's hard. It's actually really hard. I would never plant a church again. Right? I'm being honest. You think I'm kidding. Rachel and I are like, we could never do this again. 
the pint of blood, the tears and lack of sleep, the anxiety, the stress, the things that it just like, did to my, like, my, my life. And I mean, Rachel and I literally like did before different things, we'd just be on the ground and our, it was so hard. There'd be times, I remember we were, we were coming out of COVID and we were launching um, our first live service in over a year. We, we, we didn't have a building, so nobody would let us meet. And, you know, our county was very strict. And so finally found a church that let us meet on Saturdays. And, and it was, it was the, 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 the uh, Saturday service, all we could do. And I remember it was like the Wednesday before that Saturday. And one of the key people that were, was a part of our, our, our core of our church, one of the people that I felt like was like in the trenches with me. Like, like, like supposed to be like, like boxing and, and praying with me. Like somebody who like, was like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Calls me that Wednesday and just says, hey, I think we're out. And I was like, uh, okay, like, why? He's like, I just feel like we're supposed to be done. I was like, and, and again, like, this is like, we haven't had church forever. The week that we're launching again, and they were, they had a significant somewhat position in the church. I remember just feeling the greatest gut punch, like, and this is what happens when, when, when something like this happens. This is where just the mind goes, is, it, is everybody done? Is anybody going to come on Saturday? Are you done with Mission Church, Lord? And then I show up to Walnut Creek Prez on a Saturday night. And, you know, before COVID, we were having about 700 people come to church. And we show up on Walnut Creek Prez, and there's maybe a couple hundred people tops. And we had to be spread out. And Lisa starts, you know, doing worship. And I look around, and everybody's just looking at Lisa. <laughs> and uh, we weren't really worshiping. And I was like, well, my nightmare just came true. <laughs> All right, COVID, you get the first punch in and you win. I did not see people chasing after God, worshiping God. It was, it was like, we were like, we've like forgot how to like do church together and how to worship God and like pursue him with all that we have. And I remember showing up and I was uh, with, with um, my mentor that Monday. I get a, I get a golf, I get him out with my mentor Mondays. Um, he's a pastor in the area. His name's Dave Patterson. He spoke here at the father's house. And I get in the golf cart with Dave and, I tell Dave, I go, man, one of, my, uh, one, of my, uh, one of my key people at our church, they called me and they left. And I was like, have you ever had anybody who's like super key at your church leave? You know, and like, he's like, he looks at me. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> Hits me on my shoulder and he goes, Tyler, you're a great church. You're going to get punched in the face sometimes. Everything's going to be okay. Let's golf. And I was like, everything's going to be okay. Let's golf. And like, I was like, and just being around Dave, like, like he's like, Tyler, your, your church is two and a half years old. Like you got, you guys had a great calling on your life. Like th- you think you're done? I was like, I was telling him, I was like, I think, I, th- I think the Lord's done with mission. He's like, what are you talking about? You know, I was like so cynical, so doubt. He's like, he's like, come on, man. Everything's great. You're going to, your church is going to be great. And I remember like just his faith, like calibrating me, like everything's great. That person, hey, God bless you. Thanks for, the, thanks for serving for two years. I, I'm, I'm thankful. I celebrate it. We got a new season. You want to be part of the new chapter? It's all good. We're moving forward. And I remember just getting around a faith. Can you imagine if I got around the wrong person? Oh, yeah. On that Monday, I said, and guess what happened? They're like, just, you know, this person left and they were key. And I thought they, they, they said they were with me. They're going to fight with me. And they weren't. Can you imagine the wrong person? Be like, aren't people just the worst? <laughs> okay, I got a question for you. Who do you think is going to leave next? Like, I mean, I'm done. I get around the wrong person that day. And I'm done. And the reality is you get around the wrong people that don't have faith. They'll ask you questions. What bad thing do you think is going to happen next? And they make you go there instead of believing great things that your God can redeem. That's saying the valley is not the end of the story. If you are not a person of belief and you are a cynic, Can I just encourage you, start to ask God, help my unbelief. Let's become faith people for other people. Let me me keep going. So not only do you not get around faith people, but you need to get to know the people of faith in the Bible. You get to know people uh, of the faith in the Bible. And here's what I mean by that. Um, When I taught last week out of Hebrews 11, one of my favorite things was uh, each person in the Bible, like how their faith played out in life. Because a lot of you are like, all right, my faith means that I'm going to do this. Or I'm going to do this. So, sometimes you just got to uncomplicate things and start reading the Bible and realize here's what faith means for you. I want to read you one. Here's what faith, how faith played out for Abel. Some of you 
this next season, how your faith is going to play out, how your beliefs are going to play out is you're going to put God first. For the first time in your life, you're going to orient your whole life around God. Everything about your being, your time, your talents, your treasures, everything. Because here's what it said about Abel in Hebrews 11. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous. When God spoke well of his offering, by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. You got to understand something. Faith isn't just about moving mountains. Faith is about how you live your life. And it's saying that Abel made the hall of faith because he simply said, I know how to live my life. My God is first. And some of you don't have faith to make God first right now. And because you don't have God first right now, you are literally being thrown about by the enemy. Because can I just tell you quick, if God's second or third on your list, he's actually not on your list. He don't play that game. He's not like, oh, wow, thanks for letting me be fourth. I feel honored. Oh, my gosh, I got the third this week. I'm so excited. He doesn't bless being third on the list. This, 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 I'm, I'm going to preach Bible to you real quick. You will not live a blessed life. You will not live a life of authority. You will not live the life that intended for you. You will not be plugged into heaven if God is not first in your life. And so I'm just encouraging you. Live a life of faith and saying, God, I put you here, but now you are here. Another way to, to, to really strengthen your faith is to get around people of faith like Enoch. Enoch, it says in Hebrews 11, he walked with God. By faith, he walked with God. Here's what I mean by that. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Please God. Everybody say, please God. In Genesis 5, 24, Enoch's life is summed up. It's a very, in one sentence, Enoch walked with God. A.K. Enoch would wake up that day and say, I have a belief. I know that I know that if I actually live my whole day with the Lord, it's the greatest way to live my life. That I just don't pray a prayer and I walk out and do things that I literally would invite him into every single situation of my life. And because Enoch's life was built that way, he is one of the most famous of the hall of faith because literally the Lord took him and goes, I enjoy you so much. Let's, you don't even have to experience death. Get up here, Enoch. There's something about somebody who goes, I understand that the greatest decision of my life is to invite Jesus a part of every part of my life. Sometimes faith doesn't look like moving mountains. Sometimes faith looks like inviting God into every situation. Another one is Abraham. He's waiting, waited patiently. Another one's Fo, uh, uh, Moses. Uh, if I had time, I'd read through all of them, but I just want to give you some highlights. Read through Hebrews 11 and, and get to know the people of faith. Moses, uh, faith says, I won't follow my feelings. If you look at Moses, he wouldn't follow culture. He wouldn't follow his feelings. He, follow, he, he followed uh, the, the, the spirit of God. Uh, another one's Joshua, faith that thanks God in advance. Joshua was one of those guys where he would ask for it and thank God like it already happened. Yeah, that kind of thing. God, we believe for revival. God, thank you that you gave us revival. He didn't give you that. I can see it. You can't see, but I can see it. So, so that kind of faith. Another one is, um, uh, this is an interesting one, and, and this is one I really want to uh, encourage you. There's three people in the Bible that when you read their hall of faith, like, they, like these people in the hall of faith, you know, walls of Jericho, shutting the mouths of lions, you know, walking on water, splitting Red Seas, and in the midst of all these great people that did great things, the Lord decides to put three people in the hall of faith, and all they did was save their family. Let me, let me read it to you. It says about Noah, Noah being divinely warned of things, not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Let me read you another one. Uh, Moses' parents. He was led by, uh, by faith. Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's command. God goes, put Moses' parents in. Like, well, what do they do? They saved their son. Another one, Rahab, the prostitute. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, were not killed with those who were disobedient. In Joshua 2, if you know Rahab's story, this is how she got in Hebrews 11. Uh, they're, 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 they're sharing right there. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I've shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, my mother, my brother, and my sisters, all who belong to them, and they, uh, that you will save us from death. Stop. God thinks... That if you're saving your family, you are a faith-filled person. That you are standing on. My grandma is one of my greatest heroes, if not my greatest hero. She got saved, and for the rest of her life, she says, everybody in my family, I'm going to try to get saved. And it was annoying. 
Hey, every Christmas, hey, before we open presents, we got to read the Jesus story. Can you imagine being 10 and wanting to open presents and grandma like, no, we're going to read the Jesus story. And I remember like, grandma. <laughs> Todd, will you read it? <laughs> and I'd read it. And then, you know, Easter would come and she'd make us open, the, open these little eggs. that would tell the story of Easter. And, and she'd basically like, if you were around grandma, she was on a mission because she had faith that if she could give the gospel to her family, that they could be saved. And the day I did her funeral and shared about how she led me to the Lord, I'd never seen it, but I opened up her Bible. She had all us grandkids. Tyler, age four, green car, accepted Jesus. Heather, age six, accepted Jesus. Erica, Mackenzie, grandkid after grandkid, just writing down. She's just picking them off one after one after one. My daughter, Michelle, age 50. My grandma is a Hall of Faith person. Some of you are making faith in way too much complicated. Get to know the people of faith and how they conquer the world and what please God, and you'll start living a life of faith. Now, now let, me, let me just finish this real quick, and then we'll go on to prayer and fasting. Um, this week, you're going to get what I call a nudge from the Lord. And I'm going to encourage you just to live it out. You'll be at Starbucks, and you'll feel a nudge to invite somebody to church. I'm like, that's not you, Jesus. And what happens is we've done a very good job of ignoring the nudge of Jesus. I want to share a video actually real quick. I want to show you. I sometimes picture this now when Jesus is nudging me, and I want you to picture this this week when Jesus is nudging you. Check it out. <laughs> what? What? I... I I want you to picture this week. This week. I want, I want, I, I, Jesus, know like this. Be bold today. Share the gospel today. Share the gospel today. Live for me today. Live for me today. I, I want you to picture the Holy Spirit literally nudging you and actually being aware of it. Because a lot of us, just like that person, we just turn our head and go, you can nudge me all day, but I'm not going to respond. We're going to be a church that responds to the nudge of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Okay, so, so uh, are you ready to live by faith? Okay, sweet. I got uh, 15 minutes. We're doing great. Here we go. Um, let's start um, uh, living a life of prayer. So I'm not going to teach a ton on prayer because uh, I preached on prayer uh, about a year and a half ago. It's uh, what's the big deal prayer. I want to encourage you all to watch it again. Uh, I teach the Lord's Prayer and just the, the, the basis of how to pray. Um, so I would encourage you to watch it. But I do want to unpack a, little, a couple things about prayer uh, because we're going to talk about fasting in just a second. But fasting without prayer is called starving. And so, so I don't want you to just be fasting. And like, fasting for God. It's called a diet. Um, it's called, I mean, the celebrities do it. It's intermittent fasting. Big deal. Um, I need you praying and fasting. In the Bible, like, they're together, okay? Um, so I want to teach you a little bit about prayer. So, so when to pray. Um, we see in Matthew 17, prayer too often becomes a last resort. Becomes a last resort too, too often. The disciples, they weren't praying. And they just, oh, problem now? We'll pray now. And, and we're going to use this term a lot. But I want to encourage you, start praying first. Pray before you leave the house. Uh, you're going to work, pray first. Your kids are going to school, pray first. You're going to on a date, pray first. You're going to um, have a big meeting, pray first. You're going to church, pray first. Everything you do, pray first, pray first, pray first. So, so, so I, I want to encourage you, uh, pray first. Another thing is like, when should you pray? Uh, the early church prayed three times a day. Why did they pray three times a day? Uh, when you read the um, uh, Old Testament, uh, David prayed three times a day. Daniel prayed three times a day, uh, morning, evening, uh, morning, afternoon, and evening. Uh, what do they pray three times a day at their church? They pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Like they would pray in the morning, and then the middle of the day, and then evening. And I can just encourage you, uh, one prayer in the morning is not going to last you for the rest of the day. So I, I would encourage you to pray uh, throughout the day. Uh, how to pray. Um, watch my, uh, uh, what's the big deal on prayer? Uh, I teach about the Lord's Prayer. Um, there's something about being around somebody who understands how to pray. Like you, you get in a prayer circle. And like you can tell the people who have like been around prayer culture and know how to pray. Our church, if you're going to be here for a season, my prayer is that if you ever have to move, that you leave here and people are like, man, you know how to pray. Yeah. But where did you learn that? So we're going to be leaning into prayer a lot this next season in different ways. But, but one of my favorite things about Justin Toll, who just gave announcements, uh, is he came from a prayer culture in L.A. Uh, Rachel and I actually worked with him there. So we'll, as a staff, we'll start, hey, we're going to pray. And you don't have to ask Justin to like, you know, like, 
hey, Justin, can you start praying, please? Like right away, he's always like, we magnify you, Jesus. We magnify, like right away. Like he didn't say like, have you been around somebody like, hey, let's pray. And they're like, well, okay, I guess. Amen. Oh, that's powerful. That was good. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> You'll never see that prayer in the Bible, by the way. Do not give a spirit of timidity. God, not give... The reason why Justin always goes, we magnify you, Jesus, because the Lord prayer says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He's magnifying the name of all names. He's understanding who he's praying to, so you magnify the name of Jesus. There's something about people when they are so timid to pray. Can I just tell you real quick? Prayer is not a personality thing. Prayer is not a preference thing. Prayer is a kingdom come, your will be done kind of thing. It's not, I'm not giving you a magic pill. I'm just giving you a Bible real quick. And so if you don't understand how to pray and you're not praying, you know, magnifying the name of Jesus and you're not praying for his kingdom to come, his will to be done, you are vastly missing one of the greatest gifts in your life. And so, so I want to encourage you, watch, uh, watch my uh, sermon on prayer. What's the big deal about prayer? It's uh, on our YouTube. If I had more time, I'd unpack this. Uh, and then what to pray about. Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. I want to encourage you this season, Pray about everything. Everybody say everything. everything. You're like, I don't know if I have time to pray about everything. Well, statistically, you got time to complain about everything. So why don't you start praying about everything? That was me, huh? I'm trying to be, not, not you. I'm just saying I've heard statistically that the average person complains 15 to 30 times a day. And they pray maybe once a day. So their hey, they're, they're complaining tank is really powerful. Ooh, I got some complaints for you today. I mean, they are, they are interceders when it comes to complaining. Can I, can I be your intercessor in complaining? I will complain for you all day long. So you got people complaining 15 to 30 times a day on average. Uh, what was the book I read from? Uh, um, uh, best-selling author, uh, Complaint-Free World. Uh, will Bowen was the, the book um, I saw. Not only that is Stanford University to study that if you complain for 30 minutes or more in a day, you get dumber. You shrink your brain. Wrong parts of it. Like if you listen to people complaining to you and there's complaining around you for more than 30 minutes, you get dumber. Do you ever feel like society's getting dumber? Putting two and two together. I'm just saying it. I'm saying, hey, complaining is unhealthy for you. Stanford University like this is not good for your health. So instead of complaining about everything, start praying about everything. Amen. All right, let's talk about fasting. Let's talk about fasting. Um, so we talked about faith, talked about prayer. Now let's get to the part where I really want to, I want you to understand the, the importance of a fasting this next season. And for me to do that, I'll unpack a couple of things and I'll share my heart. I'll share my heart at the very end. Uh, what does the Bible say about fasting? The Old Testament commands it. Jesus uh, assumes it in the New Testament. Matthew 6, he's like, when you pray, when you give, when you fast. Like he assumes we're going to fast as a church. Uh, the uh, Pharisees in um, Jesus' day, they fasted Monday and Thursdays, um, sunrise to sundown. The reason why they picked Monday and Thursdays is because it was market day, a.k.a. that's when everybody was in town and they wanted to impress everybody by fasting. They wanted to show off fasting. The Pharisees were all about show. Fasting is not about impressing anybody. Okay, but that's why the Pharisees picked Mondays, Thursdays. The early church did not want to pick the hypocrite day, so they picked Wednesdays, Fridays, sunrise to sundown. Uh, baptism is mentioned 75 times in the Bible. Uh, baptism is mentioned 72 times in the Bible. Uh, another thing uh, I found is uh, uh, Paul and Peter never command baptizing. I mean, I mean sorry, never command um, uh, uh, fasting. But it's mentioned 20 plus times in the New Testament as an assumption, like, why wouldn't you do it? Uh, the church is always doing it, praying, fasting, praying, fasting. Um, You'll see an absolute fast in the book of Esther, aka they don't eat anything, drink anything in Esther. You'll see a, um, a vegetable only fast uh, by Daniel. All he eats is vegetables. Uh, you'll see in the um, New Testament, the early church is fasting uh, food, sunrise to sundown. Fasting primarily, actually only in the Bible, is food. And so you'll see food fast uh, throughout the Bible. You'll see Jesus do a 40 day fast in the Bible. Um, and so, so th this is what the Bible shows us about fasting. Now, what happens uh, when we fast? What happens when we fast? Uh, fasting focuses you. We get distracted. I, I mean, we just get so distracted. If I could, Jesus said, you know, you're, you're too plugged into the world in Matthew 17 and you're, and you're, um, you're too unplugged from heaven. What, what fasting does is fasting turns down the flesh, aka you're, you're, you're taking a knob like sound and you're turning down the sound of the world and you're, you're turning up the sound of heaven. And you're, you're starting to lean into the right things. So, uh, I was talking to Steve Macedes, somebody goes to our church and uh, 
We live over by Taylor and Grayson, and he, was, he lives over there too. And we're talking, and we can get no coverage. Like, no, like, like, like we're breaking, I made the joke, like, we live in the tech capital of the world, and we still have poor cell coverage in 2023. And I started thinking about fasting, and what fasting does is, a lot of time what happens when you live in the world is you're so far away from God, you literally like drop, you, you, your signal's so, so weak, you can't even hear him anymore. And what fasting does is like looking for that hot spot of the phone. Like, okay, I, and I know now, like when I drive on Taylor, like once I get to this light, I know exactly that I can actually make a call again and listen. And what fasting is and why fasting is so important is fasting isn't just something you should do, but you should go, man, fasting is about me finding a place to actually hear from God. I'm gonna leave the, the world and I'm actually going to listen to God and actually have, hear what he has to say for my life. So f- fasting um, uh, uh, brings clarity to your life. Another thing, fasting humble, humbles us. Fasting isn't us trying to move God. Fasting is us creating room for God to move in us. So, so it's the humility of saying, God, like, I, I can't do life without you. I, I need you, Jesus. Um, fasting brings clarity. Acts 13, you'll see the church send out the, um, uh, the gospel to the known world. Actually, a picture of this. Check this out. This is, uh, I believe, uh, Cyprus. Forgive me, I'm not the best geographic person. But right there, we were there in, in Israel in March. And this is actually where the gospel was sent forth to the Gentile world, to you and I. Uh, this, the center of the gospel message was in Jerusalem. And this is where the church prayed and fasted and got clarity to send Paul and Barnabas out on those waters. And the, literally the gospel has gone all the way around the world because the church prayed and fasted and said, now is the time, let's send it out. It's an amazing thing when you pray and fast to bring clarity even on the mission. Uh, faith strengthens us. Uh, Romans 8 says that we are literally wrestling with flesh, uh, our flesh and our spirit. Um, so for us to understand fasting, uh, we have to understand um, ourselves. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, you are a triune being. You are body, you are soul, and you are spirit. And so your body connects you to yourself. Let's, I think we have this uh, slide here. So we have uh, your body connects you. So you have body, craving, soul, emotional feelings. Spirit uh, is how you're laid. And I'll go to the first one, just body, uh, um, connecting yourself. So body connects us to ourselves. What I mean by that is, uh, so um, you'll be living today, and out of the blue, your body will say something to you. It's connected to you. I'm hungry, you know? Your body like, body, like I'm hurt, you know? Uh, your body uh, lusts. Like, like lust for power, lust for praise, like it lusts for things. Like it will say, I, I, I want, when somebody gets complimented, you'll be like, I wanted that. Like, like your, your body's connected to you, so, so you are flesh. Like, so flesh is a part of who you are. Then you're also soul. Soul is your emotions. Soul connects us to others. Like, so, so when you're around people, uh, we're connected to it. And there's a reason, like, when somebody, like, compliments you, it, it makes you feel better. When somebody, you know, says something terrible, it hurts you. Like, your soul connects you to people. And that's why people can affect your emotions because your souls are connected to people. So when you um, marry somebody, it says you two become one. Like, they are going to affect your soul the most. So your soul connects you to others. And the last one, at least, your spirit connects you to God. So your spirit connects you to God. Spirit wants to worship, wants to lead, and wants to pray. So here's the deal. Romans 8 unpacks this. And if I had two hours to preach my message, I would unpack every single part of the Bible for you in this, but I can't. So go home and read Romans 8. But Romans 8 says this, that your soul, aka your flesh, is pulling this way, and your spirit wants to pull you this way. Your flesh and your soul do not care about your well-being. They don't care. Have you, have you ever noticed, like, like you, 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 you do something, and you're like, Oh, I feel terrible that I did that. Why would I do that? Because you allowed your flesh to lead you to death. The Lee says that those who are led by the flesh are led to death. And so, so when we're fasting, we are literally saying, flesh, I'm starving you. You've been trying to lead. You've been trying to be the boss. Flesh uh, and, and soul, your emotions. Watch somebody who's, you see anybody who's just, are just emotionally driven? They're emotionally happy or emotionally poor. Uh, like if somebody's emotionally sad, like some people will starve themselves to death if they're just so sad. Because your, um, your, your soul does not care about your body. It doesn't care about feeding your body. And so when you allow the wrong thing to lead you, it leads to death. But then the spirit, which it says in Galatians 5, says this in Galatians 5. So I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So when you fast, you weaken your flesh and your soul and you strengthen the one that is actually going to lead, uh, lead, lead you to life and that's your spirit. So fasting is a great thing, amen? All right, so let me... Um, finish with this. Um, I was listening to a uh, leadership podcast. I listened to, I have like different things I listen to every week. I listen to a sermon, a uh, different sermon each week. I listen to like a theological teaching and I listen to a leadership podcast, like different things each week when I'm at the gym working out, I'll, 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 I'll pop one in. And I was listening to a leadership podcast um, this last week. And uh, one of my, uh, you know, heroes in the faith, he's doing a great work. Um, he's just talking about his, like his heritage. And he says, you know, I came from a prayer and fasting culture. 
And a couple weeks ago, I talked about how we can make the Lord's voice a dog's bark, like white noise, instead of actually like a baby's crying, actually ha him having our ear to speak to us. And so for the last two weeks, I've really taken that to heart. And I told the Lord every morning, you have my ear. You have my ear. I'm, I'm listening. Whatever, Lord, I'm here. Like, like you want to, you want to, you want to correct me? You want to show me something? You want to, you want to encourage me? Like, Lord, my ear is here. I'm, I'm listening. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just warming up. I'm on the elliptical. I'm listening to this. And, and he goes, I come from a prayer and fasting culture. And I actually know about the church he came from. And they were like a prayer and fasting culture. Like, they would show up on Saturdays and pray and fast all day long for church on Sunday. Like, that was their life. And out of this church, you know, he's now, you know, he's in his 60s. But out of this church, there's three to four guys who have literally planted churches out of it. And all their churches are 10,000 plus. They have great spirits. They love their wives. They're healthy. They love the Lord. And I look back at their heritage of prayer and fasting. And what they're, what they're reaping now is not because they prayed that day that happened at church. It's because they were praying and fasting for years and years beforehand. And then I got really upset and remorseful and regretful. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. AKA Lacey. Um, Lacey's the best. Um, I thought if somebody had been at our church for the last five years, would they say, man, I was a part of a church that just had a strong prayer and fasting culture. And I think when I asked that question to myself, I, I got really upset and mad at myself as a pastor because one of the greatest things that I'm supposed to do as a shepherd is to set you up to win to have victory in life and to please the Lord. And I started writing down the things that if people left Mission Church, what they would say, the kind of culture they say. And I think they'd say, man, they, they worship at Mission Church and that pleases God. If, if Ephesians says three things we're supposed to do, the, the purpose of church, worship God, equip the saints, evangelize to the, the unknown world. That's the purpose of the church. So we worship. I think we do that very well. Uh, I think we evangelize very well. Equipping the saints is making disciples. And that's where all that stuff comes in. You know, reading your Bible, praying, serving, giving, fasting. And I just feel like I just, I'd completely missed it on fasting. So I repented to our staff this last week. We do a 21 days of prayer and fasting once a year, but really that's not enough. It just isn't. And so I just started praying and you know, here's what happens. God doesn't want us to live in like, oh, I feel, I feel bad. See, remorse should lead to repentance. So then I was like, okay, Lord, let's do this. What do you want? Start praying. Ask the Lord, what does it look like? And what it looks like is as we move in this next season of our church, the first three days of every month is going to be prayer and fasting. We're going to have a Wednesday service. We always kick it off with at 9.30. We call it team prayer, but we're going to, if you can't be here, we're going to live stream it. Um, we're going to maybe add some other things, maybe even like a Zoom prayer thing if you can't come in to pray. But we're going to kick it off on Wednesday. And all the way Wednesday through Sunday, the beginning of each month, we're going to pray and fast as a church. Sunrise to sundown. And we're not just going to not eat to not eat. We're actually going to start believing what God said. We're going to start contending and seeking and praying for things that we've never prayed before. And we're going to start denying our flesh and start plugging into heaven. And we're going to see what happens for the rest of the month because we started the month the way we're supposed to start the month. Too many times we start a month very cavalier and casually, and we wonder why it didn't play out the way God called us to play it out. And from here out, we are going to start everything with prayer and fasting. And I'm praying that because we do it as a church, it spills in your life in all kinds of places. You got a big meeting on a Thursday. You pray and fast on a Wednesday because you know there's something that happens when you pray and fast. I, I'm praying that as, as the season ends here at Mission Church and maybe you're here for 10 years, 20 years, five years, but you walk out here and say, man, I learned how to have faith, how to pray and how to fast. And I became a, a disciple at that church. We're on our way, five years old. I think there's other great things to say about our church. We got a great community, 800 people, 800 plus in our small groups. I think we got a great church, but we're not perfect. You know what I'm saying? I think you'd say we're a joyful church. Are we a joyful church? I think we're a very joyful church. Some people don't like us being joyful. They're like, you're too joyful. Sorry. Um, we're going to shoot an email out with more of the things that are going to um, look like with the fasting, um, the game plan. Uh, but I, I'd ask you to prepare your heart, prepare your mind. Um, Man, let's be a praying church. Let's be a fasting church. And then let's be a faith-filled church. Will you bow your heads? God, I thank you that you're the one who leads. You're the one who guides. You're the one who saves. And today, I believe that you led people to the house for the very first time, maybe to hear the gospel news that you're the one who saves. That you're the one who died on a cross and emptied the grave. And because of that, we now get to say yes to you. We get to say yes to salvation. Yes to heaven, no to hell. Yes to blessing, no to cursing. So if you're in the room today and you've never said yes to Jesus, 
You've never said yes to salvation. And today, just something was tugging on your heart. You felt that nudge. If that's you with every head bowed and eye closed, you want to say yes to Jesus. I want you to raise your hand and catch my eye on the count of three. One, two, three. If that's you, go ahead and raise your hand. I see you. That's a great decision. I see you. That's a great decision. Anybody else want to say yes to Jesus, yes to salvation? I see you. That's a great decision. Come on. God, I thank you. 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 God, we're going to be people of faith. God, we're going to be people of prayer. And we're going to be people of fasting. We're going to unplug from the world and we're going to start plugging into heaven. Oh, Lord, we love you. We love you. Everybody said?